Hi, and welcome to Soil Science and Management, Chapter 9. Today we're going to be discussing drainage and irrigation. After we complete this chapter, you should be able to understand uh, drainage and why drainage is important for soils. Be able to explain the difference between uh, what a wetland is and what a wet soil is. How to um, utilize artificial drainage. <clears throat> different methods of irrigation, um, <clears throat> try to figure out how uh, much to irrigate, and water quality uh, problems that you can face in irrigation. So uh, in America, many of the land that we have suffers from some sort of moisture problem, whether it be too wet or too dry. Um, yeah, obviously here in California we have a, a tendency to be uh, drier in uh, in the soils just due to the uh, Mediterranean climate that we have here, and that Mediterranean climate allows rain um, typically in a glut one time per year, and the rest of the year is no uh, no rain. So that's what we deal with here locally. Uh, there are areas throughout the country where it is too wet or moist throughout the year and this causes a di different problems such as uh, anaerobic conditions um, different micro microbial growths um, uh, and drainage issues are one of those things that have to be dealt with in these situations so <clears throat> what is drainage it's you know how rapidly um, extra water leaves the soil. So <clears throat> in previous chapters, we've talked about uh, clay soils versus sandy soils. So uh, drainage becomes important when we're just discussing those different types of soils. Obviously, um, those clay soils drain a lot slower than a sandy soil. Um, things that can um, bring about slower drainage are uh, layers within the soil that will impede flow. So if there are any semi-impervious or impervious layers, they will uh, not allow water to flow through and this can then allow the drainage to become more of an issue in the upper layers of the soil. So what are things that contribute to soil wetness? Like I said before, uh, natural impermeability. So these are these clay particles or maybe there's um, rock formations that allow uh, don't allow water to flow through if you have excess flooding or uh, water runoff that is greater than the percolation rate of the soil you will have uh, excess water in the soil or a high water table and this is uh, can be found uh, in areas with uh, rivers or lakes or if you're closer to sea level, the water table uh, can stay up high enough to the soil level where it's not allowed other water to flow away because it just continues to add on to the top of that high water table. So when we have uh, this poor drainage, there are a few things that uh, can happen. Uh, number one and <clears throat> probably the biggest issue would be the lack of oxygen within the soil. If your soil is 100% saturated and uh, the water is not able to drain out, the oxygen will also not be able to be uh, have a part in that soil. There will be no pore space for the oxygen and this creates the anaerobic conditions that we um, really are trying to avoid at all costs. <coughs> Uh, very easy to see these anaerobic conditions. They are, uh, you can smell them, you can see them, turns the soil black, usually leaves a uh, sulfur type smell in the soil. Uh, secondly, due to this lack of oxygen, poor plant growth is inevitable. If the plants can't breathe, then the plants can't grow. And uh, it actually inhibits the amount of movement in the soil of nutrients. When we have excess water within the soil, it's very hard to um, operate machinery or tilling. Obviously, 
You've seen every kind of a piece of equipment get stuck if it's too moist, and this can be exacerbated by uh, poor drainage or extra uh, moisture within the soil. So wetlands are uh, areas that are wet long enough and often enough to support vegetation adapted to saturated soils. So these would be, you know, the common vernacular would be a swamp. And a wetland is typically a habitat for uh, birds and, you know, different types of uh, amphibians and reptiles. And, and, you know, obviously we have, uh, you know, alligators that will live in the uh, in these wetlands in Florida. You probably know heard about the Everglades. Uh, this is a very large wetland area that has been protected to keep a natural wetland and allow those uh, animals to live in a habitat. <clears throat> um, some of the issues that you can have there are uh, water quality and this is due to again when you have a lack of oxygen within the soil the water quality can be diminished by the microbial activity that is taking place within that soil so often um, if you have a true wetland it is hard to utilize this for any other purpose besides a habitat or a recreational area to drain a wetland takes considerable resources and uh, in this day and age probably would not uh, receive the permitting required to uh, drain many of the wetlands we have uh, some marshy wetlands in uh, the bay delta area of california <clears throat> and this is one of the most vibrant areas of california and it's being currently restored to kind of the former glory in which it used to um, exist. And this is all part of many of the uh, called eco restore projects that are happening within the state of California. So um, wet soils have uh, fewer ecological functions than uh, wetlands. These are more, uh, can be used more as farmland. And so about 25% of our farmland are these wet soils. The soils are wet most likely due to the climate in which the soils exist. Unfortunately, uh, these soils have uh, poor drainage and need to be um, need to utilize plants that don't don't mind growing in water. Uh, you can tell if a soil has poor drainage by the color. As I spoke earlier, it typically turns black because of the uh, anaerobic condition within the soil. Different microbes uh, within the soil will turn the soil different colors, and uh, that will then permeate through the soil, leaving the black color. So <clears throat> there are, excuse me, there are things that can be done to. Uh, utilize these wet soils and that would be um, artificial drainage so there are two main types that's going to be your surface drainage and that's going to be removing excess uh, surface water it's going to be canals or channels that direct water away from where you are trying to um, farm or work the land the second would be uh, subsurface drainage, and this is going to be um, pipes or other um, materials that um, um, collect the water within the soil and then don't allow the water to flow away. It will um, take the water as it's starting to drain and we'll take this water to uh, an area where you can put it into a canal or take it to another area where it has a better drainage. These underground pipes, um, if you're doing them in a landscape, uh, many people have heard of French trains. These would be a perfect example of a subsurface drainage um, application and uh, they include rocks and uh, 
certain types of pipes and they are um, then accessed as the, as the water drains out of the soil. So when we talk about <clears throat> drainage management, if we can add in these drainage tiles or drainage pipes or utilize canals to, to increase uh, drainage around um, a property, we can then increase the land productivity. We can use this land that may have been inaccessible previously for something that is, you know, a benefit to um, the landowner, i.e. you can uh, use it for farming, you can use it for cattle, you can use it for, you know, whatever it is that you decide that you want to do. When we look at landscape drainage, these are things that can um, be utilized throughout urban areas. Um, this isn't super prevalent here in California, but there are certain areas, and, and I did mention the French drains. These can present themselves in areas of low-lying or um, um, say a subdivision has a, has a lower end and all the water drains to that one lower end. These French drains or other drainage methods can be utilized to divert the water away from uh, beneficial um, uses such as homes or uh, whatever is in that area. So <clears throat> they can be used here in California, but they're, they're, this is more uh, prevalent otherwhere, other areas of the country. So when we look at irrigation systems, this is uh, the artificial application of water to a property for a beneficial use. This has uh, been used in agriculture throughout the world for a long time. Uh, the Romans did it, the Greeks did it, I believe the Chinese did it. And what it does is, is brings water to an area where it's dry um, the original irrigation systems were, you know, a river that got diverted into canals and then uh, flood irrigation was utilized to ir irrigate land or, or they built uh, canals and aqueducts to uh, move water over long distances to basically have uh, these uh, cities or, or, you know, civilization uh, spring up in areas where it may not have done previously. Currently, in, in, there's several ways that uh, water is applied. Uh, subsurface, surface, there's uh, sprinklers, there's micro irrigation, there's drip irrigation, there's uh, various different kinds of sprinklers. There's, there's numerous different irrigation applications that are out there and um, this is a big part of uh, water or horticulture in California because we don't have that natural flow. We don't have enough water that comes naturally in the summertime and we have to supplement that. So subsurface irrigation is, is any application of watering um, in the soil. And uh, as a matter of fact, I currently utilize uh, subsurface irrigation in my home, my, uh, I water my grass and uh, a ground cover that I have in my front yard all subsurfacely. The pipes are uh, about four to five inches in the ground. They, uh, they water once a week and it's, it's perfect because I don't ever have any runoff. I don't ever have any evaporation. All the water is applied directly to the root system of the plant and I don't ever have any issues. Um, Contrary to that is uh, surface irrigation, and this is basically uh, anything else that's not subsurface. The original sub, or the, excuse me, the original surface irrigation was the flooding of, of uh, farmland or other areas. This would have been uh, the furrows where you are sending water down a furrow, or there's also something called border strip, which is uh, basically a levee system that is put around a farm and the whole area is flooded to uh, moisten the soil. 
So the furrows are the long strips and the border strip would be uh, the entire area is, is flooded. <clears throat> when we talk about sprinkler irrigation, a lot of these are um, agricultural specific and some of our older technology. So the hand move irrigation is, is basically exactly like it sounds. You walk over, you move the pipe with the sprinkler uh, by hand to where you want it. There are uh, solid set irrigation. This is typically what we would think about in our home. This is, uh, you know, where it's it's set in one spot and it doesn't ever move. There's uh, the traveling gun irrigation. This is a uh, mechanism within the sprinkler that will slowly move a sprinkler throughout the uh, agricultural field to allow it to um, not have to be moved by hand and it will move itself. Uh, center pivot irrigation is ex again exactly like it sounds. There is a, a, a center pipe that a series of sprinklers will pivot around and these can be very large, very small. They can be half circles, they can be quarter circles, they can be full circles. However you utilize these uh, center pivots, it's a very common modern way of applying water to an agricultural farm. And then wheel move is basically looks like a big wagon wheel is attached to a sprinkler pipe and you have uh, sprinklers that will move and these are sort of hand moved again. They can be wheeled. There can be a motor that drives them. There's various applications for this. Um, in a home or residential system, there are also um, regular sprinklers that would be called spray sprinklers or rotor sprinklers. These are um, utilized in your grass area, anywhere else. So in your uh, landscape beds or your shrubs, roses, uh, garden boxes, you're going to use micro irrigation. So either a drip or, or drip tape, which is going to be your, uh, your irrigation hoses. There's also micro spray irrigation. This is going to be small uh, uh, spray sprinklers that um, apply limited amounts of water um, in, a, in a misting uh, formation. Hard to use sometimes in California due to the wind we have here. But uh, in your landscape, you typically utilize more than one type of irrigation system. So you'll have uh, sprinklers, you'll have micro irrigation, you'll have drip irrigation, you'll have uh, various different types. So uh, basically the, uh, the ideal use of irrigation is to um, bring your root zone to field capacity, allowing that uh, root of that plant to uh, drink the water. You don't want to irrigate every day if you don't need to. And uh, 50% of the soil has been drained and is not utilizing the water, then you're going to reapply. So you don't apply until you have, uh, until your plants have utilized 50% of the water that's been applied and is available, and then you are going to reapply. Um, so that's how you decide when to irrigate is when you get to this 50% level and you are going to use um, your ET or evapotranspiration uh, rates to determine this. So typically in California, in the hot of the summer, your plants are losing between 0.3 and 0.5 inches of water per day. And this is the amount of water that you're going to need to put back into the soil to allow those plants to remain healthy. So there are several um, ways to um, know how much irrigation to use. Um, you can touch the soil, feel it. You're going to know how moist it is by touching it. You can use uh, potentiometers. You can use evaporation pans. Uh, probably the most common thing that we do nowadays is utilize irrigation controllers to um, time these various uh, applications and uh, smart controllers are now uh, <clears throat> something that can be utilized to determine uh, how much water to be applied. This is going to be 
utilizing your uh, evapotranspiration rate again, and um, the irrigation controller will then calculate how much water to be applied every day, allowing that uh, amount of water to be only the amount of water that's lost to those plants as opposed to uh, watering the same amount every day. Because if we're watering the same amount every day, then we're, we're wasting water, we're not becoming as efficient as possible. So how much do we, do we water? This is all dictated based on what kind of type of soil, um, how deep your roots are, what type of plants, uh, what is your climate. There's various things that you need to take into consideration when we determine how much to water. And then your application rate, this depends on uh, what type of soil and how quickly that water will infiltrate. So soil versus clay and then how we're going to apply that water. So when we are saving water, we want to use the most efficient water system possible. Um, we don't want to water before we need to, only using the correct amount of water. Um, if we're having uh, shrubs, we don't want to use spray irrigation on those. We want to use drip irrigation, where, uh, where if we have grass, we don't want to use drip irrigation. We would like to use spray irrigation. So the correct application of, of uh, water to the correct product is very important to understand. Um, so when we think about our irrigation or our water, we have to think about our water quality. There are many things that can uh, be a detriment to our water quality that will allow that water to um, hurt our plants. So certain things like suspended solids, these can be an issue because they can clog your irrigation. They can uh, be uh, dirts, sands, they can be um, chemicals, various things. And then um, your soluble salts are probably your biggest thing that you need to worry about. And so you've probably heard of something called TDS. This is your total dissolved solids. That is your soluble salts. And when you um, increase the TDS level to a certain point, the water is not able to uh, be a benefit to the plant and it actually is a detriment in the uh, plant is kind of like us if we we are drinking salt water it's not healthy for us we want to make sure that we're drinking only fresh water well same goes for plants it doesn't like to drink the salt water it wants to drink fresh water um, something we can do to combat these uh, tds levels that accumulate within the soil is leaching this is applying an extra amount of water to push those salts through the root zone of the plant into a lower uh, soil layer. So just to think about what soil moisture conditions are during the growing season, these are some terminologies that you can be used. So there's um, xeric, which is equaling to dry, mesic, which is kind of your middle, or average and then hydric which is wet and you can think about that you know everybody has heard about like hydrophobia that's the, the uh, being scared of water well when you start to see that hyd at the beginning of something it typically has to do with water so um there are actually um applications where you are going to use these terminologies in the soil so we talked i just mentioned hydrophobic and there can be times when your soil becomes hydrophobic and there's almost a coating, a wax-like coating over the soil and the, the, the soil will actually repel the water away from it. So you just, I guess, more of a, a, a language terminology uh, lesson there, understanding these uh, acronyms. Uh, another one that is important to understand is with Xeric is some people have heard of xeriscaping, and this is when you are using a low water using um, um, irrigation or low water using plants, you call it xeriscaping. So another example. <clears throat> so that's uh, the end of this chapter. In summary, I hope you kind of understand what artificial drainage is and why we use that, um, different types of drainage systems, and then the different uh, drainage versus irrigation usages.
Now, something I didn't really mention is you actually um, at times will have a drainage system and an irrigation system that are used in conjunction. So you still have to get water to the plants, but at times that water can be held in areas where the plants don't like it. And that's when you have to utilize the drainage system. So I thank you. I hope, uh, I hope this lesson was good and uh, we'll see you next time.